As Durkheim observed in his psychological investigations, the average individual is intimidated by the mass of the crowd around him or before him, and experiences that peculiar psychological influence exerted by the mere number of people as against his individual self. Not only does the suggestible person find it easy to respond to the authoritative suggestions of the preacher and the exhortations of his helpers, but he is also brought under the direct fire of the initiative suggestions of those on all sides who are experiencing emotional activities and who are manifesting them outwardly. Not only does the voice of the shepherd urge forward, but the tinkle of the bellwether's bell is also heard, and the imitative tendency of the flock, which causes one sheep to jump because one ahead of him does so, and so on until the last sheep has jumped, needs but the force of the example of a leader to start into motion the entire flock. This is not an exaggeration. Human beings, in times of panic, fright, or deep emotion of any kind, manifest the imitative tendency of the sheep, and the tendency of cattle and horses to stampede under imitation. To the student experienced in the experimental work of the psychological laboratory, there is the very closest analogy observed in the respective phenomena of the revival and hypnotic suggestion. In both cases, the attention and interest is attracted by the unusual procedure. The element of mystery and awe is induced by words and actions calculated to inspire them. The senses are tired by monotonous talk in an impressive and authoritative tone. And finally, the suggestions are projected in a commanding, suggestive manner familiar to all students of hypnotic suggestion. The subjects in both cases are prepared for the final suggestions and commands by previously given minor suggestions, such as stand up or look this way, etc., in the case of the hypnotist, and by all those who think so-and-so stand up, and all who are willing to become better stand up, etc., in the case of the revivalist. The impressionable subjects are thus accustomed to obedience to suggestion by easy stages. And finally, the commanding suggestion, Come right up, right up, this way, right up, come, I say, come, 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 etc., which takes the impressed ones right off their feet and rushes them to the front, are almost precisely the same in the hypnotic experiment or seance on the one hand and the sensational revival on the other. Every good revivalist would make a good hypnotic operator, and every good hypnotic operator would make a good revivalist if his mind were turned in that direction. In the revival, the person giving the suggestions has the advantage of breaking down the resistance of his audience by arousing their sentiments and emotions. Tales depicting the influence of mother, home, and heaven. Songs like, Tell Mother I'll Be There. And personal appeals to the revered associations of one's past and early life tend to reduce one to the state of emotional response and render him most susceptible to strong, repeated suggestions along the same line. Young people and hysterical women are especially susceptible to this form of emotional suggestion. Their feelings are stirred, and the will is influenced by the preaching, the songs, and the personal appeals of the co-workers of the revivalist. The most sacred sentimental memories are reawakened for the moment, and old conditions of mind are reinduced. Where is my wandering boy tonight brings forth tears to many a one to whom the memory of the mother is sacred, and the preaching that the mother is dwelling in a state of bliss beyond the skies, from which the unconverted child is cut off, unless he professes faith, serves to move many to action for the time being. The element of fear is also invoked in the revival, not so much as formerly, it is true, but still to a considerable extent and more subtly. The fear of a sudden death in an unconverted condition is held over the audience, and why not now, why not tonight, is asked him, accompanied by the hymn, Oh, why do you wait, dear brother? As Davenport says, It is well known that the employment of symbolic images immensely increases the emotion of an audience. The vocabulary of revivals abounds in them. The cross, the crown, the angel band, hell, heaven. Now, vivid imagination and strong feeling and belief are states of mind favorable to suggestion as well as to impulsive action. It is also true that the influence of a crowd largely in sympathy with the ideas suggested is thoroughly coercive or intimidative upon the individual sinner. There is considerable professed conversion which results in the beginning from little more than this form of social pressure. 
and which may never develop beyond it. Finally, the inhibition of all extraneous ideas is encouraged in revival assemblies both by prayer and speech. There is, therefore, extreme sensitiveness to suggestion. When to these conditions of negative consciousness on the part of an audience there has been added a conductor of the meetings who has a high hypnotic potential, such as Wesley or Finney, or who is only a thoroughly persuasive and magnetic personality, such as Whitfield, there may easily be an influence exerted upon certain individuals of a crowd which closely approaches the abnormal or thoroughly hypnotic. When this point is not reached, there is still a great amount of highly acute, though normal, suggestibility to be reckoned with. The persons who show signs of being influenced are then labored with by either the revivalist or his co-workers. They are urged to surrender their will and leave it all to the Lord. They are told to give yourself to God now, right now, this minute, or to only believe now and you shall be saved, or won't you give yourself to Jesus, etc. They are exhorted and prayed with. Arms are placed around their shoulders, and every art of emotional persuasive suggestion is used to make the sinner give up. Starbuck, in his The Psychology of Religion, relates a number of instances of the experiences of converted persons at revivals. One person wrote as follows, My will seemed wholly at the mercy of others, particularly of the revivalist M. There was absolutely no intellectual element. It was pure feeling. There followed a period of ecstasy. I was bent on doing good and was eloquent in appealing to others. The state of moral exaltation did not continue. It was followed by a complete relapse from orthodox religion. Davenport has the following to say in reply to the claim that the old methods of influencing converts at a revival have passed away with the crude theology of the past. I lay particular stress upon this matter here because, while the employment of irrational fear in revivals has largely passed away, the employment of the hypnotic method has not passed away. There has rather been a recrudescence and a conscious strengthening of it because the old prop of terror is gone and it cannot be too vigorously emphasized that such a force is not a spiritual force in any high and clear sense at all, but is rather uncanny and psychic and obscure, and the method itself needs to be greatly refined before it can ever be of any spiritual benefit whatever. It is thoroughly primitive and belongs with the animal and the instinctive means of fascination. In this bold, crude form, the feline employs it upon the helpless bird and the Indian medicine man upon the ghost dance votary. When used, as it has often been upon little children who are naturally highly suggestible, it has no justification whatever and is mentally and morally injurious in the highest degree. I do not see how violent emotional throes and the use of suggestion in its crude forms can be made serviceable even in the cases of hardened sinners. And certainly with large classes of the population, the employment of this means is nothing but psychological malpractice. We guard with intelligent care against quackery in physiological obstetrics. It would be well if a sterner training and prohibition hedged about the spiritual obstetrician, whose function it is to guide the far more delicate process of the new birth. Some who favor the methods of the revival, but who also recognize the fact that mental suggestion plays a most important part in the phenomena thereof, hold that the objections similar to those here advanced are not valid against the methods of the revival, inasmuch as mental suggestion, as is well known, may be used for good purposes as well as bad, for the benefit and uplifting of people as well as in the opposite direction. This being admitted, these good folks argue that mental suggestion in the revival is a legitimate method or weapon of attack upon the stronghold of the devil. But this argument is found to be defective when examined in its effects and consequences. In the first place, it would seem to identify the emotional, neurotic, and hysterical mental states induced by revival methods with the spiritual uplift and moral regeneration, which is the accompaniment of true religious experience. It seeks to place the counterfeit on a par with the genuine, the baleful glare of the rays of the psychic moon with the invigorating and animating rays of the spiritual sun. It seeks to raise the hypnotic phase to that of the spiritual mindedness of man. To those who are familiar with the two classes of phenomena, there is a difference as wide as that between the poles existing between them. As a straw showing how the wind of the best modern religious thought is blowing, we submit the following from the volume entitled Religion and Miracle, 
From the pen of Reverend Dr. George A. Gordon, Pastor Emeritus of the New Old South Church of Boston. For this end, professional revivalism, with its organizations, its staff of reporters who make the figures suit the hopes of good men, the system of advertisements, and the exclusion or suppression of all sound critical comment, the appeals to emotion and the use of means which have no visible connection with grace and cannot by any possibility lead to glory, is utterly inadequate. The world waits for the vision, the passion, the simplicity, and the stemmed truthfulness of the Hebrew prophet. It awaits the imperial breadth and moral energy of the Christian apostle to the nations. It awaits the teacher who, like Christ, shall carry his doctrine in a great mind and a great character. While there have undoubtedly been many instances of persons attracted originally by the emotional excitement of the revival, and afterwards leading worthy religious lives in accordance with the higher spiritual nature, still, in too many cases, the revival has exerted but a temporary effect for good upon the persons yielding to the excitement, and after the stress has passed, has resulted in creating an indifference and even an aversion for true religious feeling. The reaction is often equal to the original action. The consequences of backsliding are well known in all churches after a spiritual revival. In others, there is merely awakened a susceptibility to emotional excitement, which causes the individual to undergo repeated stages of conversion at each revival, and a subsequent backsliding after the influence of the meeting is withdrawn. Moreover, it is a fact known to psychologists that persons who have given way to the emotional excitement and excesses of the typical revival are rendered afterwards far more suggestible and open to isms, fads, and false religions than before. The people flocking to the support of the various pseudo-religious adventurers and impostors of the age are generally found to be the same people who were previously the most ardent and excitable converts of the revival. The ranks of the Messiahs, Elijahs, and Prophets of the Dawn, who have appeared in great numbers in this country and England during the past fifty years, have been recruited almost exclusively from those who have previously experienced the revival fervor in the Orthodox churches. It is the old story of the training of the hypnotic subject. Especially harmful is this form of emotional intoxication among young people and women. It must be remembered that the period of adolescence is one in which the mental nature of the individual is undergoing great changes. It is a period noted for peculiar development of the emotional nature, the sex nature, and the religious nature. The existing conditions at this period render the psychic debauchery of the revival, seance, or hypnotic exhibition particularly harmful. Excessive emotional excitement, coupled with mystery, fear, and awe at this period of life, often results in morbid and abnormal conditions arising in afterlife. As Davenport well says, it is no time for the shock of fear or the agony of remorse. The only result of such misguided religious zeal is likely to be a strengthening in many cases of those tendencies, especially in females, toward morbidity and hysteria, toward darkness and doubt. There are other facts connected with the close relation existing between abnormal religious excitement and the undue arousal of the sexual nature, which are well known to all students of the subject, but which cannot be spoken of here. As a hint, however, the following from Davenport will serve its purpose. At the age of puberty, there is an organic process at work which pushes into activity at nearly the same time the sexual and the spiritual. There is no proof, however, of the causation of the latter by the former, but it does appear to be true that the two are closely associated at the point in the physical process where they branch in different directions, that at that critical period any radical excitation of the one has its influence upon the other. A careful consideration of this important statement will serve to explain many things that have sorely perplexed many good people in the past, in connection with revival excitement in a town, camp meetings, etc. This apparent influence of the devil, which so worried our forefathers, is seen to be but the operation of natural psychological and physiological laws. To understand it is to have the remedy at hand. But what do the authorities say of the revival of the future, the new revival, the real revival? Let Professor Davenport speak for the critics. He is well adapted for the task. He says, there will be, I believe, far less use of the revival meeting as a crass coercive instrument for overriding the will and overwhelming the reason of the individual man. 
the influence of public religious gatherings will be more indirect, more unobtrusive. It will be recognized that hypnotization and forced choices weaken the soul, and there will be no attempt to press to decision in so great a matter under the spell of excitement and contagion and suggestion. The converts may be few, they may be many. They will be measured not by the capacity of the preacher for administrative hypnotism, but rather by the capacity for unselfish friendship of every Christian man and woman. But of this I think we may be confident. The days of religious effervescence and passional unrestraint are dying. The days of intelligent, undemonstrative, and self-sacrificing piety are dawning. To do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with God, these remain the cardinal tests of the divine in man. Religious experience is an evolution. We go on from the rudimentary and the primitive to the rational and the spiritual. And, believe Paul, the mature fruit of the Spirit is not the subliminal uprush, the lapse of inhibition, but rational love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. The law of concentration is one of the major principles which must be understood and applied intelligently by all who would successfully experiment with the principle described in this course as the mastermind. The foregoing comments by leading authorities of the world will give you a better understanding of the law of concentration as it is often used by those who wish to blend or fuse the minds of a crowd so they will function as a single mind. You are now ready for the lesson on cooperation, which will take you further into the methods of applying the psychological laws upon which this philosophy of success is based.